afternoon, and thank you all for holding. Your lines have been placed on a listen-only mode until the question and answer portion. I would like to remind all parties the call is now being recorded. If you have any objections, please disconnect at this time. And I would now like to turn the call over to Michael Cook. Thank you, sir. You may begin. Good afternoon. I'm Michael Cook, Chief of the Public Information Office at the U.S. Census Bureau, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. We'll be giving you a preview of what to expect for next week's release for the first set of coverage estimates from the 2020 Post Enumeration Survey, along with additional results from the 2020 Demographic Analysis Estimates. As you may know, both the Post Enumeration Survey and the Demographic Analysis Estimates are independent of the 2020 Census and serve as important measures of how well we achieved our main mission for the 2020 census, which is to count everyone once, only once, and in the right place. This upcoming release will follow the variety of other detailed analysis we've previously released, such as information on how we managed and implemented the census, an analysis that compare the first census results to other ways of measuring the population. Together, all of these measures provide us with a fuller picture of the quality of the 2020 census. Next week's results will tell us how well we counted the nation in the 2020 census and if we under or overcounted certain groups such as by race or Hispanic origin, by age groups and sex, and by tenure. It will also estimate the proportions of census records that are correct, wrong, or we don't have enough information to be sure on what uh, sure on way which way one way or the other. All of these estimates will be available March 10th at the national level only. We'll release additional coverage estimates from the PES, including the state level this summer, along with further coverage estimates from demographic analysis with the demographic and housing characteristics release. Quick note, if you'd like to ask a question today, you need to dial into our phone line at 1-888-790-3166 and use the passcode that you see on your screen. We'll be taking questions from the media, stakeholders, and partners at the end of today's presentations. Our presenters today are Eric Jensen, Senior Technical Expert for Demographic Analysis, Population Division, and Timothy Kennel, Assistant Division Chief of the Statistic Methods and Decennial Statistical Studies Division. They'll walk us through the purpose, methodologies, and types of results that will release March 10th from the Post Enumeration Survey and Demographic Analysis. Without further delay, I'll turn it over to Eric Jensen. Eric? Thanks, Michael. Demographic Analysis, or DA, is a longstanding program that Census Bureau uses to evaluate the quality of the decennial census. DA was first used by the Census Bureau in 1960 and has been used every decade since. For de demographic analysis, we produce national-level estimates of the population on census day by demographic detail. The estimates are produced using current and historical vital records, data on international migration, and Medicare records. We did not use any 2020 census data, so the DA population estimates are completely independent of the census. In fact, we released the DA population estimates in December of 2020, several months before the first census results were released. Census Bureau uses the results in demographic analysis to develop estimates of net coverage error at the national level by demographic detail. And this metric gives us insight into the quality of the 2020 census, as I'll explain momentarily. The methodology used to create the demographic analysis estimates is built upon decades of extensive research and collaboration, both internally and with expert demographers around the nation. The DA method uses the demographic balancing equation, where population equals births minus deaths plus immigration minus emigration. The birth and death, rec death records come from the National Center for Health Statistics. The data on the mass migration come from many different sources, but mainly from the American Community Survey. The birth records before 1945 were not as complete as they are today, so we use Medicare enrollment records for the cohorts born before 1945 which is the population age 75 and older on April 1st, 2020. 
We do make adjustments to the Medicare records to account for people that are ineligible for Medicare, who delay enrollment, or who never enroll in Medicare. Finally, to calculate the total population, we add up the estimates for each birth cohort and then add those to the Medicare-based estimates for the older ages. While we use all these data, the birth records are really the foundation of the VA estimates. To help conceptualize the VA method, here's an example. From 1990 to 1991, there were 2.1 million male births in the United States. From 1990 to 2020, there were 68,000 male deaths to that birth cohort. Also, as of April 1st, 2020, we estimate there were an additional 355,000 males added to that cohort due to international migration. So if you take the births, subtract deaths, and add international migration, we estimate that there should be about 2.4 million males aged 29 in the 2020 census. And as you can see from this example, the birth records account for the largest part of the estimate for this cohort. DA estimates are only produced at the national level. As I explained earlier, the birth records are the foundation of the DA estimates. The birth records list the state and county where a person was born, but we just don't have the data and methods to place them where they were living on census day, April 1st, 2020. For example, I was born in Idaho, and I've lived in several states as an adult. The birth records would put me in Idaho, but how would we track my migration over the life course? There would be a lot of uncertainty in any, in any state or county um, DA estimates if we tried to produce them for all ages. However, we are planning to produce a set of state and county estimates for the population age 0 to 4. We feel that we can estimate migration for this population over four years with some confidence. Um, these estimates, however, will not be part of the release next week. The DA population estimates are then used to calculate net coverage error. Net coverage error is calculated by taking the census count minus the DA estimate, then we divide by the DA estimate and multiply by 100 to get a rate. We use the DA population estimates as the benchmark when calculating the DA net coverage error estimate. We produce the DA estimates of net coverage error at the national level for specific demographic groups. Net coverage error combines both undercounts and overcounts for the same group. This means that if the group had a large undercount and an equally large overcount, we would show that as a net coverage error of zero. So however, groups that are consistently undercounted in the census usually do not have large overcounts too. For example, the college age population is a group for which we see both undercounts and overcounts, but their net coverage error in DA is usually positive, meaning overall we show them as being overcounted. DA is useful for showing patterns about coverage across demographic groups. We can look at these within a census or across multiple censuses. Demographic analysis has historically been used to highlight coverage differentials by race. Also, the DA results help us understand coverage patterns by age, such as large undercounts for young children, that is a persistent pattern we see in the decennial census. This graph shows the demographic analysis net coverage error from 1960 to 2010 which again is calculated as the percent difference between the census counts and the DA estimates. In this graph, we see that in 1960, all groups had an undercount. The undercount for adult black males was much larger than the other groups. Over time, coverage for all groups improved in the decennial census, as you can see with the net coverage error getting closer to zero. The total population and the non-black population is undercount even switches to an overcount in 2010. But even then, there's still the large differential between adult black males and other groups. Again, the DA results have historically been used to highlight differential coverage patterns across demographic groups. There are both strengths and limitations to the DA estimates of net coverage error. For example, the DA population estimates are produced using administrative data, including birth and death records, Medicare enrollment records, and data on international migration. Nearly all of the data used for the 2020 DA population estimates were produced before April 1st, 2020, and are therefore unaffected by the COVID-19 pandemic. 
Now, his strength is that the methodology was developed through close collaboration with ex external experts. We worked with a group made up of demographers from universities, research centers, state governments, and other federal agencies to develop the methods used to produce the 2020 DA estimates. The strength of DA is what it tells us about specific birth cohorts, so we can release our estimates by single year of age and very detailed age groups. The DA general methodology has been consistent for decades, so we are able to look at historical patterns across different censuses. And finally, DA is a powerful method for highlighting coverage differences by race, as I showed earlier. Of course, there are limitations to the DA method. First, we can only produce estimates of net coverage error. We can only produce estimates of net coverage error, which combine both undercounts and overcounts. Also, the estimates are only available at the national level, again, because we do not have the data and methods to estimate migration over the life course. In addition, race and Hispanic origin detail in the DA estimates is limited to the information available in the historical vital records. Early vital records only included race the race categories black and white, and it wasn't until 1990 that all states included information on Hispanic origin on their birth certificate. Finally, it can be difficult to measure international migration for the DA estimates, especially over time. International migration is the largest source of uncertainty in the DA estimates of net coverage area. So what has been released and what will be released? On December 15, 2020, we released the DA population estimates. And again, this was five months ahead of the first results from the 2020 census being released. And we did this to show that the DA estimates were independent of the 2020 census. On that day, we released three sets of estimates, and we produced a range of estimates, a low, a middle, and high, to reflect uncertainty in the data and methods used to produce the estimates. We also released the components of population change for all three sets in series. We've also released several of the DA net coverage error estimates for the 2020 census. For example, we released the DA net coverage error estimates for the total population on April 26 of last year when the apportionment totals were announced. We also released the DA net coverage error estimates in November of 2021 that correspond with the available 2020 census redistricting data. This table shows the results from the national total, which again was released on April 26th as part of the apportionment release. We show a range of estimates. We produce this range by varying the level, the level of historical births, international migration, and enrollment in Medicare across the three series. International migration accounts for the largest differences between the series, followed by Medicare enrollment and then historical births. For the low series, we showed an overcount of the national total of 0.22%. For the middle series, we see an undercount of negative 0.35%. And for the high series, we see an undercount of negative 1.21%. This table shows the DA net coverage error estimates for the data available in the redistricting files, which again were released in August of last year. We see the same results for the total population that we saw in the last table. With the redistricting data, we can look at some additional, we can look at some age patterns. For example, the population under 18 years, as well as the population 18 years and older. This table also shows the net coverage rates for the Hispanic population under 18 years. We can only produce DA estimates for the Hispanic population 0 to 29 in 2020 because it wasn't until 1990 that all states included Hispanic origin information on their birth certificates. Next week, we will release even more net coverage error estimates for the 2020 census. These estimates will be presented in three separate tables. The first is by single year of age and sex. So we'll have data for the total population by single year of age, then by male by age, and female by age. Next, we'll release a table showing selected age groups. These will mostly be, these will mostly be five-year age groups. Finally, we're releasing a table by age and sex that shows the same broad age categories used by the PES. 
Because the single year of age data have not been released yet for the 2020 census, we are using a special tabulation of 2020 census with confidentiality protections applied using the 2020 census disclosure avoidance system. We are not releasing the DNA coverage year estimates by race and Hispanic origin at this time. In order to make comparisons between the DA population estimates and the census counts, we need to use what is called the modified race file. This file, which is produced by the Population Estimates Program, will include the 2020 census data and race categories that are consistent with the race categories used in the Population Estimates Program. These net coverage error estimates will be released at a later date. Finally, we will release the results from our experimental series. These estimates use new data and methods to develop population estimates for groups that we haven't been able to look at in the past. They will provide more race and Hispanic origin information than what we currently have on the official DA estimates. Also, we, will, we are working on subnational DA estimates for young children. Now I'd like to turn it over to Tim to talk about the post enumeration survey. Thank you, Dr. Jensen. I'm happy to be here to share some information about the 2020 post enumeration survey, which I will refer to as the PES and hopefully answer many questions you have about what to expect at our data release next week. The post-enumeration survey measures the coverage of people and housing units in the census. It provides both measures of net coverage error and gross components of coverage. The net coverage tells us whether the overall census counts were too high or too low. The gross components of coverage provide estimates of how many people were correctly counted, erroneously counted, or missed in the census. Data are used by stakeholders to assess the success of the census. Internal Census Bureau stakeholders also use the PES results to inform plans for the next census. The PES started with a sample of about 10,000 blocks across the country. As a part of the PES, housing units and people in these blocks were listed from scratch and independent of the census. The people and housing units in the PES were then matched to the census. After this matching, the PES and census data were combined using dual system estimation, also known as capture recapture, to estimate the population size. The Census Bureau has conducted post enumeration surveys since 1950, although dual system estimation wasn't used until around 1980. The PES will not produce estimates of coverage for the population living in group quarters, such as college dormitories, nursing homes, and correctional facilities, nor for people living in remote Alaska areas. Remote Alaska areas have historically been out of scope for Census Bureau post-enumeration surveys because of the seasonal movement of people throughout the year, which makes it infeasible to accurately conduct the matching and follow-up operations necessary for dual system estimation. Group quarters, such as college dormitories, nursing homes, and prisons, are out of scope because their population can change significantly between the census and PES enumeration interviews. As Eric mentioned earlier, demographic analysis includes the PES universe plus people living in group quarters and in remote Alaska areas. In 2010, the census counted 308.7 million people. However, about 8 million people were in group quarters or remote Alaska areas. So the census count for the PES universe was about 300 million point, 300 point seven million, as seen in this first row. The second row shows the demographic analysis mid-series and post-enumeration survey estimates of the population size in 2010. Demographic analysis and the PES can have different estimates of census coverage because they include slightly different groups. Eric has already provided a definition of percent net coverage error. The PES uses the same definition. However, the PES uses a very different methodology to estimate the population size. In the past, the post enumeration survey only reported the undercount. So the sign of the coverage estimates from previous post enumeration surveys have the reverse signs as I will report uh, next week. The key thing is to note that a negative sign means the census counted too low or an undercount. A positive number means the census was too high, and a number close to zero means the census count was about right. In addition to percent net coverage error, we will also be reporting components of coverage next week. 
Components of coverage, sometimes called gross coverage, show a more detailed view of the quality of the census. Every record or person in the census could be classified as either correctly enumerated, erroneously enumerated, or a whole person imputation. First enumerations refer to people counted in the census who were living in the United States on April 1, 2020, the reference day for the census. Based on follow-up interviews, the individuals should have been counted and they were counted in the census. Erroneous enumerations include duplicate records of people counted in the census, as well as, as well as people who were counted but should not have been. For example, they may have died before April 1, 2020, or were just visiting the country. Whole per person census, census imputations. For some addresses in the census, we didn't receive a response with enough characteristics. So we used a statistical technique called whole person imputation to fill in the blanks. We really didn't have enough complete information on the characteristics to be sure if these were correct or erroneous. So we put them in a special category. To avoid any confusion, I want to mention that the administrative record enumerations and proxy responses uh, are generally not considered whole person imputations. The administrative record enumerations and proxy enumerations are included in, in the estimates of correct and erroneous enumerations, just like any other response. As I mentioned previously, the PES estim estimates the size of the population. This estimated population size is divided into two groups, those who are correctly enumerated in the census and those who are not correctly enumerated, called omissions. The census might have accounted for some of the omissions as whole person imputations, while others may have been missed altogether. Through much field, uh, field work and clerical review in sample areas, the PES is able to estimate the components of coverage. Here are the components of coverage measured by the 2010 Post Enumeration Survey. The, just the top of the bar is shown here. There are many correct enumerations shown in blue, um, and there are so many that you wouldn't be able to see the other components very well. So this graph zooms in on the top of the bar. On the left, we see the census count. In 2010, most of the census records, 284.7 million, were correct. About 10 million, shown in red, were erroneous, and 6 million were whole person census imputations, shown in purple. The estimate of the population size is shown on the right. Of that, 284.7 were correctly enumerated in the census, and about 16 million were omissions. In 2010, it so happened that the number of omissions was about the same as the number of erroneous enumerations plus whole person census imputations together. Thus, the census counts were close to the PES estimate of the population, as indicated by the fact that the top of both bars was about the same height. If there was an undercount, the left bar would be lower than the right bar. For an overcount, the left bar would be higher than the right bar. In 2010, the top of the bars were indistinguishable. Next week, we'll show you the components of coverage for the 2020 census. The PES certainly has some strengths. The PES can produce estimates by characteristics collected in the census, such as race categories used in the census, and whether someone owns or rents their house. Another advantage of the PES is that it supports estimates of components of coverage, including estimates of the number of duplicates and other erroneous enumerations. Also, while the PES is impacted by a variety of errors, dual system estimation is robust against many errors as long as they're independent between the census and the PES. The PES does also have some limitations. Because the PES is a sample survey, the estimates are subject to sampling errors. We measure these sampling errors and report them as quality measures. The quality of the PES is related to a number of factors such as response error, non-response error, and matching error. Another limitation, which I already mentioned, is that the PES universe excludes people living in group quarters and remote Alaska areas. A final limitation is that the 2020 PES cannot support sub-state coverage results. I know a lot of people will be interested in knowing the census coverage for their neighborhood or local area, but the 2020 PES sample size and design cannot accurately support such detailed estimates. No survey is without challenges or errors. Most of the PES operations were conducted during the COVID-19 pandemic. Some modifications to the PES were made in response to this pandemic. 
Probably the most visible modification was delaying the field work. Many surveys doing in-person interviewing in the summer and fall of 2020 suffered from large amounts of non-response. Delaying field work and extending deadlines probably contributed to the PES having higher response rates than many other surveys. Nevertheless, these delays also increased the time between the census and the PES interviews. Some people think that the lag might have decreased the quality of the reported data about who is living in the household on census day, but we don't have measures to know that for certain. Many colleges and universities either closed or pivoted to virtual learning in 2020. This contributed to a major migration of young adults, often back home and into the household population. This migration made it challenging to determine who should be included in the PES and who was out of scope because they should have been counted in college dorms or other group quarters. Another challenge was related to increased levels of people not answering specific questions called item non-response in the census and the PES. It's hard to conduct the matching and follow-up work required for dual system estimation when characteristics are missing. Despite these challenges, the PES maintained a high degree of quality. We performed quality checks on almost all of the PES interviewers and clerical matching staff. When problems were found, the original data was corrected. As we've done in the past, the PES also mounted a large follow-up field operation to gather additional information about people who are missing from either the census or the PES. And as I already mentioned, we extended some field data collection periods and also delayed some field operations until many lockdowns had ended. Properly searching the census for people in the PES is very important to the quality of the PES estimates. As we had done in the past, we did not restrict our matching to small areas. Indeed, we searched the entire census files to see if we could find PES respondents in the census. Although the matching was not perfect, this nationwide computer searching helped us better understand if movers were correctly enumerated in the census or not. Despite all of our efforts to have high response, we inevitably had some missing information. And when that happened, we used statistical techniques to reweight non-responding households and to impute missing responses. Next week, we'll be releasing the first set of PES results. We will be posting two reports to the PES website. The first report will include census coverage results by demographic characteristics. The tables in these reports can also be downloaded at data.census.gov. The second report, the source and accuracy statement, is a technical document that will include some quality metrics for the PES and describe many of the survey errors pertaining to the PES. This slide shows the tables that will be in the reports released next week. It will include net coverage rates and components of coverage by the five breakdowns indicated on this slide. We can only publish components of coverage for the relationship to householder not net coverage results. To calculate net coverage, we need to measure characteristics in a similar manner for both the PES and the census. Although the PES collected a relationship to the householder, we found that the householder sometimes differed between the PES and the census. This inhibited our ability to produce net coverage error rates by relationship to householder. And to some extent, determining the householder when we did the interviewing, it would depend on who was answering the door. In general, the tables released next week will mirror the tables published in the 2010 post-enumeration survey. Here is the main components of coverage table from 2010. We will be publishing a similar table next week. Here we see an example of the percent net coverage error tables. Each row will show a demographic characteristic. The net coverage error rate and the estimated standard error will be shown for each characteristic. The net coverage error rates that are statistically significantly different from zero will be identified with an asterisk. When we see the asterisk, we have enough confidence to say whether there was an undercount or overcount. The race and Hispanic origin table will show the race groups on this slide. A person who marks multiple races will appear in multiple rows of this table. For example, if someone reports Asian and Native Hawaiian, they will be included in both the Asian and Native of Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander rows. Here we see an example of components of 
coverage from 2010. The percent of the components of coverage will be shown in the columns. With the exception of the relationship to householder variable, the components of coverage tables will also show emission rates on the right. Upcoming PES releases. In the summer, we'll be releasing three more reports. The first report will include person coverage for the states and various census operational characteristics. Many of these tables will show components of coverage broken down by operational characteristics, such as for the non-response follow-up universe, response mode, and whether the, re whether the respondent was a proxy or not. The third report will show census coverage rates for housing units. Currently, we're conducting the clerical matching activities for housing units. The final re report will show census coverage for people and housing units in Puerto Rico. In addition to reports about census coverage, we'll be releasing a series of reports describing our estimation methods as we have done in the past. Many of these reports will include quality metrics about the PES, such as response rates and item imputation rates. Although not on this slide, we're also working on assessments of the five PES field operations and three major clerical matching phases, but we don't have specific release dates for those. I wanted to reiterate that I'm looking forward to the press conference next week and hope it will provide some helpful insights into the coverage of the 2020 census. This concludes my remarks about the post-enumeration survey. I'll now, now pass it back to Dr. Jensen. Thanks, Tim. Today we released a random sampling blog that provides additional background on the Census Bureau's coverage measures. Included with that blog is an infographic that summarizes the main similarities and differences between demographic analysis and the post enumeration survey. We wanted to go over a few of these and encourage you to check out these measures, these resources. The main difference in the method, the main def difference is the methodology or the type of statistical method used. The DA coverage estimates are produced by using basic demographic accounting, the basic demographic accounting equation of population components of change for ages 0 to 74, and then met the Medicare enrollment method for ages 75 and older. Yes, coverage estimates are produced using dual system estimation, where we conduct an independent survey and match that information to the census results. Another difference is the population universe, or which population is included in the results. Demographic analysis makes its estimates for everyone living in the country, while the PES makes estimates for the household population, excluding remote Alaskan areas. Both coverage programs produce estimates for the nation, but PES also produces coverage estimates for states, which will, re which will be released later this summer. Finally, both DA and PES produce estimates by demographic characteristics. And this is really important because it tells us which population groups may have had coverage issues. For demographic analysis, these include age, both single year of age and age groups, sex, male and female, and broad race groups, black and non-black, as well as black loaner combination and non-black loaner combination. Also, we produce DA estimates for, by Hispanic origin for ages 0 to 29 or the population born after 1990. PES produces estimates by age groups, sex, and the same race categories used in the 2020 census. And PES produces estimates by Hispanic origin for all ages. The PES also produces estimates by housing tenure or whether the household owns or rents the housing unit. Now I'll turn it back over to Michael Cook. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Eric. You may have noticed that I've joined my coverage measurement counterparts and have donned a bow tie for today's webinar. This is a simple way for us to show some solidarity, given that we haven't seen each other in person for more than two years, and hope you've enjoyed it as much as we have. Now, let's get into the Q&A. We'd like to start taking questions now from the media first, then open it up to our invaluable partners and stakeholders. As a reminder, you must call the phone number displayed 
on the slide on your screen. You cannot ask a question if you don't dial into your phone line. Before asking your question, please state your name and either your news outlet or organization. You want to fit in as many questions as possible, so please only ask one question with one follow-up allowed. Operator, I'll now hand it over to you for additional instructions. Thank you. And at this time, we will begin the question and the answer session from the media, census partners, and stakeholders. To enter the question queue, press star 1 and record both your name and organization clearly. Both your name and organization are required to introduce your question. Our first question today comes from Hansi Wang from NPR. Hi, Hans. Hi, thank you very much. Um, if you could sum up again, what metrics did the Census Bureau use to determine that the quality of the post enumeration results are um, ready to be released to the public? And as, as my follow-up question, if I can ask just for, for time's sake here, why is the Census Bureau not releasing state-level results of the post enumeration survey at the same time as the national-level results as they did, uh, as the Census Bureau did after the 2010 Census? Thanks for those questions about the uh, post enumeration survey. I'll turn them over to Tim. Sure. Uh, so in reviewing the quality of the post enumeration survey, uh, next week you will see the source and accuracy statement will report uh, response rates and imputation rates um, in that report, so you can see, see that. Uh, we did a thorough comparison of the post enumeration survey estimates to demographic analysis as well, um, and check them for, for soundness. Um, so we've, we've done quite a bit of work. Um, throughout the whole process, we've been doing a lot of quality uh, checking uh, in our operations. Regarding the state level estimates, uh, we wanted to prioritize the demographic characteristics first, and as soon as we got those, you know, we wanted to, you know, check those and send them out. Um, and that's why we're releasing those sort of early. Um, but the operational metrics and the state tables will come out later. There are a lot more states for us to check and review and, and look through. So there's more review on, you know, ongoing for those, and that's why those were um, in the summer release. Thanks for those, uh, those questions, Hansi. Um, operator, do we have our next caller? Thank you. Our next question comes from Mike Schneider from Associated Press. Hey, Mike. Um, uh, yeah, hi. Um, my question is for Tim, and, and thank you all for having this. Um, if the PES is excluding group quarters, is there any way that the Census Bureau is going to know how good a job it did counting group quarters, and obviously this is um, this was a big concern during the 2020 count. So, uh, correct, the, the post enumeration survey will not specifically provide estimates of the group quarters. We will have a variety of operational assessments about the group quarters operations, so we can see you know, how things worked uh, through those operational assessments. And then I will also highlight <laughs> for my colleague Eric that Demographic analysis does include the people living in group quarters. They don't break out separately group quarters in housing unit populations, but they are included in, in those estimates as well. Thanks, Tim. Um, also a reminder um, for all of our listeners to check out our press kits online. That's where you'll find a number of resources, including more information about next week's data release and uh, the news conference. A link to today's slide deck uh, will be available um, within the next few days, um, and, a, and a recording of today's event as well. Um, you can also find links to blogs and other content to take a deeper dive into the PES and also the DA. Operator, do we have another caller by chance? We have a follow-up from Hansi Wang from NPR. Um, Hi again. Why does the, excuse me, let me mute my, sorry for the echo there. Uh, why do the post enumeration survey uh, coverage estimates, uh, why do they not include among the racial groups two or more races? 
Thanks for that question again about the post enumeration survey, Hansi, and specifically um, about the amount or um, whether or not it, why it doesn't include two or more races. I'll turn that over to Tom. So uh, we will produce the race breakdowns for a race alone or in combination uh, next week. Um, so the people who, who select multiple races are included in the data and the tables that we'll be releasing, but we don't separate out uh, people who uh, check off one race and another, who select the multiple races. Um, we don't separate them out because they're a smaller sample size, and so we need to collapse them, and so we've collapsed uh, into the groups of race alone or in combination. And if I can ask for my follow-up question, um, when the Census Bureau released the redistricting data, uh, the race ethnicity data through the redistricting data last year, uh, the Census Bureau said, put out a warning essentially, you know, it is important to note that these data comparisons between the 2020 Census and 2010 Census race data should be made with caution, taking into account the improvements we have made to the Hispanic origin and race questions in the way we code what people tell us, unquote. Does, is the Census Bureau um, issuing any similar guidance warning to data users uh, who may be interested in comparing the post the, the, these latest post generation survey results with past coverage measurements regarding race ethnicity groups? Thanks for that line of question or follow-up question, Hansi, about guidance on comparing um, race and ethnicity data from this year's post enumeration survey uh, to past data. Um, that we have available, and I'll turn it over to our uh, SMEs to address. Um, so, no, we, we don't have direct uh, cautionary statements. Uh, we will produce the uh, estimates. You'll see one table next week that will have the race alone or in combination groups uh, for 2020 coverage, and it'll right next to that you'll see the 2010 and then some uh, results as well. Um, it's very true that the composition of the, the race groups have changed over time, uh, and the questions have changed um, as well, but uh, we're not in our reports currently um, making any cautionary statements. Thanks for that, um, Tim. Um, and um, I want to also remind everyone um, we already discussed, and we know that next week is when the results are going to be coming out, but um, I want to remind them that it's next Thursday, March 10th at 10 a.m. Um, you can expect um, the same similar format um, with today's presentation, but we'll be able to share with you um, what the new results will show um, from the 2020, um, and um, we'll tell you more about the quality. So, operator, um, do we have... Um, any more callers? I know that uh, we might need to give some instructions again. And as a reminder, if you would like to ask a question, if you're a stakeholder or partner, please press star 1. Once again, questions from stakeholders or partners, please press star 1. While we wait for our first question, um, from our invaluable partners and stakeholders. I want to remind everyone that we do have a lot of events coming up um, that may be of interest to you. Um, after we hold the news conference next week on the results from the post enumeration survey and demographic analysis at 10 a.m., uh, we'll host another webinar giving a preview of what to expect uh, for the release of the 2016 to 2020 um, American Community Survey five-year estimates. This webinar will be at 2 p.m. Eastern uh, next week. The ACS five-year data will be available under embargo on March 15th at 10 a.m. Eastern with public release at 12.01 a.m. Eastern, March 17th. Our county and metro uh, micro area population estimates are scheduled for embargo uh, March 22nd at 10 a.m. Eastern for embargo subscribers, and the data is being publicly released on March 24th at 12.01 a.m. Eastern time. And then on April 1st, the National Archives and Records Administration is scheduled to digitally release the 1950 census population records. The Census Bureau will hold a webinar in advance of that release of the 1950 census records on March 14th. 
Um, check out our newsletter updates and census.gov for more details on those events. Operator, do we have our next question? I do. Our next question is from Susan Merriam from Columbia University. Hi, Susan. Hi. Um, there seems to be an undercount in a number of census blocks with correctional facilities compared to the Department of Corrections count. If you don't use the PES to double check counts from the correctional facilities, what do you use and how do you explain the undercounts? Hi, Susan. Um, I'll turn this over to the SMEs, but just wanted to, to remind everyone that we haven't released the data yet um, from and the results from the Postal Enumeration Survey. We will be releasing that um, next week. Um, and I'll turn it over um, to, to Tim if he has any remarks. Yeah, only that we will not be releasing estimates of uh, undercounts or overcounts for correctional facilities. I'm not sure that's going to be done. Uh, we, we don't have measures for that at the Census Bureau, so this will be from other sources outside the Census Bureau. And, Susan, if you have any confusion with that, um, I encourage you to reach out to the Public Information Office at 301-763-3030, um, um, and we'll assist and try to square square uh, you away or answer any questions you might have, given um, not knowing what you're looking at right there. Thanks for that. Operator, do we have a next caller? I do. Our next question comes from Marvin Nelson from North Carolina House of Representatives. Hi, Marvin. Hi. It's actually the North Dakota House of Representatives. And in my district and my county, uh, I have the Turtle Mountain Band of, of Chippewa Indians. And the way the census was conducted was really problematic because the federal government decided there would be no home delivery of mail on reservations. And then the Census Bureau did not mail forms to a P.O. box. So, and, and small towns, in, which are what's in my district, are the same way. So almost no one directly got Census Bureau mailing. And then, due to COVID, there was no home-to-home. -home. And so in this county, the tribe, there's good federal data. They would say they have at least 17,500 Native Americans. And between the Native Americans and the non-Native Americans, the census only came up with 12,000 people. Is there going to be a correction or is there just going to be 10 years of, of cutting of federal programs and stuff for these people because of this huge undercount of Native Americans? Thanks for that question, um, uh, Marvin, or that, uh, that comment. Um, Within, with what you said, um, uh, I will say that um, when we release the data next week, um, we will have additional SMEs, subject matter experts on the line that will talk a little bit more about the things that we did um, to ensure or to um, get the um, people to respond, specifically, um, as you noted, in Indian country or on tribal lands. Um, I'm looking now to my subject matter experts to see if there's anything they'd like to add, um, but um, we will definitely um, be able to give you more sound. Um, and if you want that answer now, um, before um, next week, if it um, sounds like, you know, calling or who, where you are calling from, I encourage you to reach out to us at the Census Bureau, and we can talk to you a little bit about our TEA operation um, and, and other things. Um, hope that helps. And, and who would I reach out to about that? Um, I would reach out to, um, you can call the Public Information Office, 301-763-3030, uh, and I'll put you in touch with um, our folks in our Office of Congressional and Governmental Affairs. But we'll make sure um, that you get uh, the answers um, and we have that conversation with you. Appreciate your... Yeah, because it's such a huge concern because they're so reliant on federal uh, programs and they all are based on your census numbers. And, I mean, it, it, there is no question that it, that it's... It, I, I think it's at least a 40% undercount, and and uh, and it happened throughout the state, really, with our all five of our reservations, and and it's it's really frustrating because it's as if the way the census was conducted was designed to undercount uh, because of the home delivery. You know, people live in a large city and they're just used to stuff comes to their house, but it doesn't happen in these rural areas, and it doesn't happen on any Native American reservation. 
Right. And, and again, I apologize um, for today's webinar, um, the preview, if you will, of what's happening next week. Um, don't necessarily have the right subject matter experts on the on the phone right now and in front of you. Sure. You can talk about that uh, those programs. Well, I'll, I'll try and be back on next week. So thank okay. you, thank you, sir. Operator, do we have another caller? I do. Our next question is from William O'Hare from O'Hare Data and Demographic Services LLC. Hi, William. Hi. Can you hear me all right? Loud and clear. Fantastic. Well, first of all, thanks for putting this on uh, a week ahead of the data you can release next week. Uh, really helpful, so thanks. The, the question I had, if I understand correctly, with the demographic analysis, the error between the demographic analysis estimates and the census counts is partly due to coverage error and partly due to error injected by differential privacy. If that's correct, can you give us any guidance on how much of that difference is likely due to real error and how much is due to differential privacy? Thanks for that question. I'm going to turn that uh, question on uh, demographic analysis over to, to Eric. Yeah, thanks, Bill, for your question. So as I mentioned in my presentation, um, in order for us to release our net coverage error estimates at this time by demographic characteristics, single year of age, and sex that haven't been released yet in the 2020 census, um, we had to use a special tabulation of 2020 census data um, that had all the privacy protections applied through our disclosure avoidance system. Now, a couple things. One is um, this is national level data. And even though it's single year of age by sex, it's still um, pretty large groups. And so the impact of differential privacy on those uh, on that special tabulation is relatively small. In fact, we um, are confident that it doesn't impact the um, estimates of net coverage error in any meaningful way. Thank you. Thanks for that, Eric. Operator, do we have uh, another caller? Question? I do. Our next question is from Roger Lentz from Wilson, North Carolina. Hello, Rob. Hello, how are you? I'm well, I'm well. Yeah, my question is, um, you've shown some uh, air rates, potential air rates at a nationwide um, survey of by race um, in high poverty communities like ours. Is there any differentiation in air rate based on uh, poverty and age? So we did an online we did an online census, um, and we have populations that were either high poverty or older that you know, did have difficulties filling that out or even knowing what to do. So how does that air rate differentiate or, or vary amongst, um, you know, not just race, but then within that age and income? Thanks for that question. A line of questioning, Roger. On, um, um, I'll toss that over to, uh, to, to Eric. Oh. Um, or, I'm sorry. I, I can talk about that as well. So one is we do not have any coverage estimates by poverty status, and that's because we don't include questions on poverty in the census or in the PEF. Um, and another thing to stress is that the results that are released next week are national level results. Um, and so people are going to want to know, what's the coverage for my city? Was there an undercount in my neighborhood? And we're not able with our um, coverage programs to to give that level of detail. But what we are able to give are, you know, the national trends. With demographic analysis, we're going to have age and sex um, results that are very informative. And also PEF, Tim has listed all the different um, tables and everything that will be released then. But we do not have estimates of coverage by poverty status. We do by age, though. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks for that. Operator. Do we have another caller? I do. Our next question is from Hansi Wang from NPR. Hello again, Hansi. Hi again. Has the Census Bureau finished all in-person interviews, follow-up interviews for the post enumeration survey? Uh, the last the Bureau told NPR was they were supposed to end in March 2022. And if it has ended, when, when, what's the last date of those interviews, in-person interviews? Thanks for that line of questioning about interviews um, around PS. Um, Tim, do you have that information in front of you? 
on top of mind? We are wrapping up the uh, field and clerical matching operations. Uh, right now we are for housing units. So we have finished all of the person field work and the uh, person matching operations that I'm producing. You know, we're going to be releasing the person estimates uh, next week, uh, the first set of them. The housing unit operations are still ongoing, and right now we're uh, focusing on the housing unit clerical matching work. Uh, that will be continuing uh, for another few few months. Um, and then we'll, we'll start looking towards uh, tabulation and releasing those estimates in the summer. If I guess for, for my follow-up question, why uh, did the Bureau decide to extend that for, for the housing estimates this uh, follow-up interviews past March for a few more months? The field work, um, I was talking about the whole phase that includes the field work and the matching. That's still ongoing. There's no extension uh, of the, the field operations. So that is scheduled to end in March. And the, uh, the matching work as planned, I think that was scheduled to go until the very beginning of May, and uh, we will be meeting that deadline as well. And then um, we'll, as soon as we get the data, we're working as fast as we can. As soon as we get that data, we're going to start, you know, doing our estimation, and we'll be releasing the reports as fast as we can. Thank you. All right. Thanks for that. Operator, do we have um, another question? I do. Our next question is from Yvette Rubidou from National Congress of American Indians. Hi, Yvette. Hello. Thank you for taking the question. I, um, we had heard that the sampling was going to be less in the PES in 2020 compared to 2010. And I'm really worried that the sampling around looking at American and Alaska Native data and differences between on and off reservation won't be enough to show differences. Um, can you comment on that? Because that, that comparison is really important to us because we suspect that, the, that we have a big undercount again on the, as the prior caller talked about, on the uh, reservation areas compared to off reservation. But I'm just worried that the sample might not be enough to show that. Can you comment on that? Thanks for that question. Um, I believe I'm going to toss this over to Tim um, to address. Yep. So our, our sample design is very similar to 2010, uh, as well as the sample sizes uh, that we, we started off with. And we oversampled uh, states and areas with American Indians. Um, so I think, you know, next week, I'm sure, <laughs> we will be producing estimates for American Indian uh, alone and in accommodation uh, for those on the reservation, for those on American Indian land, but off the reservation, and for the balance of the, the United States. And those meet our quality standards that we can release those estimates. You know, we have, we have rules about you know, what we can release, um, and those are going to be quality estimates, I think, <laughs> that, um, that we'll be sharing next week. Thanks That's for that. great to hear. Thank you. Very welcome. Thanks for calling, Yvette. Operator, do we have another question or a call? And sir, I'm showing no further questions at this time. Thanks for that. Um, I'm going to pause just one second um, to see if we have any more um, callers. We want to make sure that we give everyone an opportunity to, to ask their question. We're at the top of the hour at 2 o'clock. Um, and operator, could you just check one last time for me, please? Thank you. Well, looks like that's all we have. I'd like to thank you for your question. I apologize. I do have a question. Okay. One moment, please. We have a follow-up from Hansi Wang. Hi again, Hansi. Hi again. I wanted to get confirmation um, that the coverage estimates by race that were released after the 1990 and 2000 census, is it true that they were only released 
for uh, there were no that data was released not in alone or in combination. Is that correct? Thanks for that line of questions about uh, cover adjustments uh, released, um, historical cover adjustments released. Um, do you guys, um, who wants to take a bite at that apple? Sure. Um, so that's correct. In 1990 and 2000, uh, there was a different protocol for um, calculating race, and we had different uh, options from the Office of Management and Budget. So we uh, did not tabulate. Uh, coverage estimates for alone or in combination. We put people in one of the race groups uh, for the 1990 and 2000 uh, post emergency savings. Thanks for that, Tim. And, and just to remind folks and, and Hansi alike, back in 1990, um, you could only select, um, couldn't select more than one race. So um, there's a difference and a nuance there. Um, so I'm Right, if I can ask just a follow-up then. So in 2000, when multiple race options were allowed for respondents, why did the Census Bureau decide not to release coverage estimates by race uh, in a loan or in combination, given that data was uh, – that was a response option that was available in 2000? Thanks for that, Ozzy. Um Turning to back to our SMEs to take a bite of that. Uh, so I, I don't think I have the, the full answer for you, but I can at least mention that our um, the number of people selecting multiple races and our understanding of race and how we identify with ourselves has changed over time. So I would just mention that as part of as we look about race over the decades, our understanding and our identification with race changed over time. And we've been seeing uh, a trend over the, the decades <laughs> that uh, more people are selecting, you know, multiple races um, in the, yeah. So I just wanted to note that in terms of comparing uh, race groups across time, that, that is a caveat that we should be aware of. Um, and I can get back to you on that, that question you have about specifically why in, in 2000, I, uh, it was uh, we released the estimates the way we did. Thank you. Thanks for that, Hansi. Um, and since we extended this, I know we may have had someone else that asked a question, so I'll check with the operator one more time before I close out today's webinar. Operator, I do. I, I do. I have a question from Kathy Allen from Clinton Township, Butler County. Hi, Kathy. Hi. Thank you for taking my call. Um, <clears throat> I live in a very small rural township just north of Pittsburgh in Butler County. And um, initially when the census results came out in the fall, it said that we had an increase uh, of 64%. And it must have been a typo or something. Since then, I see that the increase was only 1.5%. My question to you is, how could that happen? Was it an error? Uh, the surrounding uh, municipalities and townships uh, also have a, uh, a low percentage increase. Um, again, my question is, when I go into the Pennsylvania State Association of Township Officials and look at the updated census for 2020 from last fall, it shows only a 1.5 percentage increase, but the federal statistics that came out in the fall showed like a 64% increase. I mean, that's just, it, it's impossible. Was that an error? Tell me, tell me what that's all about. Thank, thank you for that line of question. And um, again, um, just to remind uh, folks that um, there's a lot to unpack when it comes to the 2020 census count, and I don't necessarily have or have brought today um, the SMEs that can address that line of questioning. Um, uh, they're here to talk about the uh, post enumeration survey and the demographic analysis uh, released next week. If you could do me a favor um, and call 301-763-3030, yes. um, we've got uh, public affairs specialists that will assist you. 
um, take all that information so that we can deduce exactly what information you're looking at um, and get the right subject matter expert to address your line of questioning. But I do appreciate okay. you calling and your answers. Right. Um, and, three zero one seven six three three zero three zero. That is correct. That is correct. Thank you. You're very welcome. Very welcome. And operator, was that the last call? Yes, I am showing no further questions at this time, sir. Thank you. Um, and thank you all for your questions and for joining today's webinar. Uh, we hope that today's webinar helps you understand how the results will uh, the results will be released March 10th from the Demographic Analysis and post generation Survey. Um, we hope that it, it will help you um, evaluate, um, uh, and you'll see um, whether the census counts uh, for certain groups were too low, um, meaning the census likely missed some people, um, or whether the uh, counts were too high, indicating some people may have been counted more than once. Um, we also hope that you have a clear sense now of what we're planning to release next Thursday um, from the demographic analysis and the post enumeration survey. As a reminder, um, go to census.gov to access our press kit for more information and resources. And if you have additional questions, or by chance you didn't have a chance to, to dial in and ask your specific question today, please call us at the Public Information Office at 301-763-3030 or toll free at 877-861-2010. And again, that's toll free 877-861-2010 or email us at PIO at uh, census.gov. I encourage you to sign up. Uh, to our email list so that you can get timely updates on all that we do at the Census Bureau. And again, on behalf of Tim um, and on behalf of Eric, I'd like to thank you for joining us um, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. This does conclude today's conference. You may disconnect at this time.